You know, um, I'm not sure. So I think there's this thing that kind of happened where my graders got busy towards the end, so it's been taking a little bit longer. Um, how has it been as far as this quarter versus the past? Because the thing, the thing about it is, is so I put in a request for my department to have two TAs next quarter for this course and two TAs for my next course. And they declined my request. They said they won't, they can't do it. So um, I, think if, I think if you as students wrote to the department, and I'm not, I'm not telling you to do this, right? But I think if you, if you wrote to the department, like sent, in, sent them an email and said, hey, this situation really sucks. I, it, take, it took way too long for things to be graded. I'm not happy. I think if you, if you all said something to the department, I think that that would force them to make a change. This university does try to save as much money as they can. It's the model that every organization in this country is following. And the only way that they won't nickel and dime you to death is if you force them, you drag them and you say, no, that sucks, make it better. That's what I've found too when dealing with these types, any entity at all, not just universities, but like anything, they're, they're gonna go as cheap as they can until they're forced based off of unpopular opinion to do better. It's kind of how it works. So I would say if you, if you don't like the grade, the, the way that how, much, how slow things are for grading, which I don't like it either, I think it sucks, please write to uh, anybody at the university, the chair, whoever. Send, send some emails to the chair, actually, if you want to. If you, don't, if you think that it, it, there's not enough TAs. I'm not gonna say that there's not, in my opinion, I think there is not enough TAs. I think there should be two TAs for a class this size. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say would be great. I think it would help all of us out if, if, if we have more like actually call the university to task. And I'm not, blaming, I'm not blaming the chair of the physics department. It's more of a decision made by the university as a whole after certain things happened last year which I won't go into, political things. But basically, yeah. OK, so um, more questions about stuff. That's it? OK, I'm going to make a comment about something. Um, I think the grade scope scanner is a piece of junk. And I, I'm definitely going to put in a request to get it um, repaired. But basically, um, so when, when we do the final, the final is not going to be stapled. It's going to be paper clipped so that it's much less likely for the pieces of paper to get stuck when it goes through the scanner for grade scope scanning. So when you get your final, and I'll say this again when we actually, when the time comes, but when you get it, write your name on every piece of paper because it's not going to be stapled. It's just going to be paper clipped. But we're going to do that as a first order prevention for, to prevent this from happening. And then a better solution would be to get a better scanner in the future. Although, I don't know if there are scanners out there. I don't know what the market looks like for scanners. Can we get one that's like, that doesn't have that issue? I'm not sure. But we'll do the paper clipping thing to fix that. Um, OK. Any more questions about, yes? No, the midterm is already, it's not curved. So a curve would be like just giving like a blank pers number of points to somebody. So like if you, if you sat for the exam and you wrote nothing on your exam and I did a 15 point curve, you'd still get 15 points. What I did for the curve is on the exam, you had the opportunity, it wasn't a curve, but you had the opportunity to earn more than 100 points if you worked every problem, which nobody did really. I mean, a few people got more than 100. But then basically, you can't earn more than 100% on the exam. The score that you get is out of 117, but it's not out of 117 percentage-wise. So let's say you get 85 out of 117. What's your final score? 85 out of 100. Not 85 out of 117. So that's, that's, why, that's why I did that, because I found that the time that it took for people to complete the exam was a little bit too much. So that way, grading it that way was a way to sort of balance for that. Because like I said, I've never taught this course before. 
So I don't, each chapter is different. And some of these chapters, they take, the problems take longer than others. So the exam was a little long. It was a little long by about two to three questions. So that's why I, in, that's why I imposed that score system. So again, if your score was, say, um, 105, what did you get on the exam? You got 100. You don't get more than 100. If you get 105 out of 117, your score on the exam is not 105. It's 100 percent. Okay, but that's but it's not 105 out of 117 either because that's less than 100 percent. Does that make sense? What I did here, basically, it's kind of like um, if I made the exam like do two out of three problems, but then if you attempted all three, you got partial credit for doing all three. So it's like. That was what my way of, of taking care of that situation where people were running out of time. OK? So yeah, so that's how the exam is graded. So the score that you have, again, one more time, if you've got like a 91, it's not you don't have a 91 out of 117. You have a 91% on the midterm, too. Things like that, for example. OK, more questions before we jump into this. Anybody have a question? Yes. So evidently, um, no. I think if you're CAE, the there may still be a few scores outstanding, and then there was also the issue where, when it went to the scanner and grade scope, some of the pages got stuck, so people did not get their scores. That wasn't Charles's fault. That's just because of bad equipment. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to the department about getting better equipment. Because I don't like that, that that's happening. That's, that's unacceptable, in my opinion. That's too much uh, error. Now, if that ever does happen, we always save the exams. And we always have them there. The, the copy always exists. So it's not like it's lost forever and you're not going to get your score. However, I don't like that there's that ambiguity where you're expecting to get your score like everybody else and you don't. So again, we're going to fix that problem. That's not going to happen with the final. Because with the final, um, after everybody does the final, um, Charles and I are going to scan them. And we're going, to, we're going to make sure we're going to do a head count right then and there. Because the final is the final, right? It's important. We, can't, we, can't, we, don't, have that, we don't have any leeway here. That's the last time you see me for the course. The course is over after that. So I can't, I can't be like saying, oh, what if this person who has a zero actually sat the final and it's in the box somewhere, but it didn't get scanned properly. So we can't do that. So I got to do a head count for the final and make sure everybody's in there. As a matter of fact, bring your student ID to the final, because I think we're going to have enough time to actually get a head count. In fact, I think I'm going to print out a roster, and I'm going to have everybody check your name on the roster. But it's, it's got to be like ID and name, right? Because otherwise, somebody could check the different name or something. I mean, that's very unlikely. But you know, you have to be, we have to be like methodical about this. So you bring your, bring your student ID. I'll have a roster set up. You check your name off. And that way, we know that you sat for the final and that we need to have a head count for you. If we don't have a score after we scanned everything into grade scope, got to go back and got to figure out where, you're, where you are in that pile of exams. That'll be the proof check level to prevent this from happening with the final. Yes, question? No, the final is going to be a little different than the midterms. The final is going to have a cumulative element. Most of the material is going to be from the last two chapters that you haven't had the that haven't been tested over yet. It's mostly going to be relativity and that chapter on light and Maxwell's equations. But there's also going to be some cumulative component. But again, no circuits. We're not going to do any of the phasor diagrams or the circuits on the exam. Focus on magnetism, forces on magnetic charges, magnetic fields, um, and then also Faraday's law. That's fair game. Um, and then maybe just other things that are not involving circuits like uh, induction. Could be mutual induction, self-induction could be a fair topic. And we'll, we'll talk about that more when we do the review on Thursday as well. But might as well get it out there now, because this is kind of a review day as well. 
OK, so that's sort of the, so th expect 70% of the exam, 70% again, to be relativity and that light chapter. The other 30% remaining cumulative stuff that's sort of like, that's all based around what we did from the previous two midterms, but not the exact same questions. Different, different questions, different material. Yes, question. The, the actual deadline for the homework assignments is the end of the course. And I don't care if it's late. Like I said, you get, it's worth, what, 5% of your grade, but you get all 5% no matter how late it's done, as long as you do every problem. And I don't care how many mistakes you made on it. It's homework. It's supposed to be learned. And so that's why I give you, you know, you're supposed to make mistakes while you're learning and, and trying it, figuring out how to solve the problems. So I don't want to grade you and have that grade count as your final grade. Any element of that, I feel like that's not uh, scientific. That's not how learning works. So I won't do that. Yes. Uh, you know what? So when it comes to homework, sometimes I'll put a couple of problems on there that I want you to work for the homework grade. But it, it won't be. Um, on considered on the midterm. There's too much material and too much of it is important for me to only teach what I will test you over, right? It's not possible. Like I can't just teach you for the test. The test is sort of like to gauge, I take a sampling of questions that, I've, that are based around material I've taught you to gauge your understanding and that's what the exam tests. But there's material, there's more material than just that. So the stuff that's a little bit harder becomes a homework problem, and I don't expect you to solve it in class. Standing waves are a little bit more difficult. They're a little bit more involved. But I don't think it's outside of the ability of you as students to do it when you have your own time, especially since you can talk to Charles about the uh, homework questions and get help during discussion. Oh, there's another thing. Definitely come to discussions. There will be a problem that Charles is going to do that I'm not going to cover that will be on the final. Just one, but there will be one. So if you don't go to the discussion, you're going to miss out on that. And I'm going to start doing that from now on because the discussion sections are very important. Like, it's very important to utilize the maximum amount of resources that you have for learning. So I want, if the attendance drops really low in the discussion, what that tells me is like, a lot of people aren't using that resource. So there could be a couple reasons for it. Maybe the discussions need to be changed in format a little bit. I want the format of the discussions to be, you get your homework questions answered first, and then you get any questions about the material I've taught first, and then if there's time left over, we do other stuff. But the, I can assure you that I have seen the question, and it, it does relate directly to what we do in this course. So it's not going to, the question isn't going to be like out of some random thing. It's going to involve this, this idea of relativity that we've been covering. So it's, it's not going to be, out, it's going to be a good question. Um, but yeah, definitely want to definitely go to discussion. Um, so more questions before we get going. Because this is the second to last class. So if you have any questions, it's a good time to ask. OK, I think that's it then. So um, we're just going to do a quick review. So we talked about how if two events take place at the same point in an inertial frame S, an observer in a frame S prime moving relative to S observes a time interval between these events that is greater than in S by the Lorenz factor. And this factor is substantially different from 1 only if the relative speed of s prime and s is a substantial fraction of the speed of light. However, there's this question about who is moving in whom's frame that looks like kind of a paradox. Because if I'm moving at some relative velocity, I can't say if I'm the one who's moving or another person who in my frame is not moving is not moving or vice versa. 
That's the whole point of relativity. That's why when we looked at the length contraction and we said, okay, if, 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 I, if I'm moving and I see the other person as length contracted, what do they see? Well, they also see me as length contracted. But then we've got this paradox involving time because it turns out that time has an irreversibility to it. So there's this sort of like hand wavy argument for the twin paradox. And I'm, I say it's hand wavy because it does a pretty good job of answering the question, but I think the fundamental answer about the nature of time has yet to be fully explained by physics. I mean, when you hear about why does time, the laws of physics work equally well forwards and backwards in time, but there's an asymmetry there because when we have an actual physical process going, there are processes that simply only go in one direction in time. And usually we have to go into another branch of physics to explain that. We usually have to jump into StatMech and start talking about entropy and how we have irreversibility associated with physical processes and the irreversibility defines an arrow of time. However, does it really? I mean, yes, it does, but what's the exact connection between entropy and time? We don't have a nice simple equation for that, and there probably ultimately needs to be one somehow, but we don't have that yet. But anyway, just to get into this uh, twin paradox, think about it from the perspective of it starts with the paradox that if, if somebody moves really fast up by um, and close to the speed of light, and a twin stays on Earth and doesn't move at all. The person who's traveling, they're, they're not going to be aging as much, right? They're gonna, their process of aging is going to be different. But then when they come back to Earth, who can say who was the one moving? Because the person who was on Earth could just say that from the perspective of the twin who's moving but doesn't know they're moving, they can say, but I thought you moved away from me. So why did only one of the twins age? And why, did, and why did the age, uh, like say the twin goes so close to the speed of light that they basically don't age at all, and then they come back. The other twin could equally well say, well, well I, I saw you fly away at this speed, and that's why you didn't age. But then the twin could say, but I saw you fly away. I was just going at some constant velocity the whole time. So there's this paradox. Why is, there, why is it actually observable that there's a difference between the two twins' frames of reference when relativity says, by definition, there shouldn't be. So it has to do with acceleration. So for the twin to come back, there had to have been some acceleration involved, which changes things up a little bit. So just to sort of give it to you in the... <clears throat> so these equations for time dilation, uh, and I'll just put these out on the board here. So we've got delta t equals gamma delta t naught, where we remember gamma is 1 over square root 1 minus 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, That's our gamma factor. And then they used u for the relative velocity, which is fine. I can switch to u for that. Just know that it's the relative velocity, v1 minus, v2 minus v1. If the first person is not moving at all, then v1 is just 0 then. That's been most of the cases we've looked at. And then we've got delta t then is, turns into that. So. Consider identical twin astronauts named Eartha and Astrid. Eartha remains on Earth while her twin Astrid takes off on a high-speed trip through the galaxy. Because of time dilation, Eartha observes Astrid's heartbeat and all other life processes proceeding more slowly than her own. Thus, to Eartha, Astrid ages more slowly. When Astrid returns to Earth, she is younger, has aged less than Eartha. But all inertial frames are equivalent. Can't Astrid make exactly the same arguments to conclude that Eartha is younger? Couldn't she say that? Because who can say who is moving? With the train example that we did, when the person's on the train moving, 
and the other person is on the ground, the person on the train doesn't know they're moving, they could think the, per the whole ground and everything that, that's passing them is what's moving. And they can make that argument and it's valid because both frames are inertial, neither one is accelerating. Um, so that's the paradox. Uh, each twin, then each twin measures the other to be when they're ba when they're uh, back together, and that's a paradox because that can't be. So to resolve the paradox, note that the twins are not identical in all respects. While Eartha remains in approximately inertial frame at all times, Astrid must accelerate with respect to that time frame during parts of her trip in order to leave turn around and return to Earth. Eartha's reference frame is always approximately inertial. Asteroids is often far from inertial. Thus, there's a real physical difference between the circumstances of the two twins. Careful analysis shows that Eartha is correct. When Astrid returns, she is younger than Eartha. Okay, so that question didn't answer anything. They just said, okay, you know what? It's different because she accelerated, so her reference frame wasn't inertial, therefore, that's the reasoning behind it. But does that explain why she aged differently? No, it doesn't. So here's my explanation for it. And this is, this is not in your textbook, and it's a little bit like, I'm not gonna say it's different than, it's, it is physics, but it's like, it's gonna involve so anyway, there's a, there's a quantum relationship between time and energy. And the, there's canonical conjugates in uh, quantum mechanics. Position and momentum are canonical conjugates. And that means that they're related in a geometrical way, in a quantum sense. And what I'm talking about with quantum stuff is we move from a coordinate space where we just talk about position to a coordinate space where we have to talk about position and momentum at the same time, a phase space. And so, because there's an uncertainty between position and momentum, I make, in other words, I have an ambiguity there where there's a certain uncertainty with how much position and momentum I have. There's a relationship there then. But there's a relationship quantum mechanically at the fundamental level that extends to classical physics. So what am I talking about here? Okay, so a change, what is, what is position and what is momentum? How are the two related to each other? Let's think about it loosely. When I have momentum, I have basically a velocity, a mass and a velocity. Well, what's a velocity? It's a change, it's a type of change of position. So I could say that momentum and position are canonical conjugates and mathematically, they're connected to each other because if I have my momentum, my momentum gives a change in position, okay? If I, if I do that same kind of reasoning for energy and time, which are also canonical conjugates, I could say that a, an energy corresponds to a change in time. So remember, in order to give something energy, you basically have to accelerate it. So we could say that the, the change in time that this twin, that the, the change in time associated with this process can be attributed to the acceleration that the twin undergoes and the energy transfer that occurs. And that also ties in with entropy because entropy typically involves processes that have an energy transfer essentially to it as well. But anyway, without, I can't go into any more details about that because it would take up too much time, but that's a slightly more better explanation than the book, I think. As long as we have um, a perceivable frame where there was acceleration that occurred at any point, the two frames are not perfectly symmetrical. An acceleration ruins the symmetry and we can pick out which inertial observer stayed inertial and which inertial observer had an acceleration. And we can pinpoint that by how the passage of time was different for the two observers, which makes a perceivable difference. Yes? Would, 
Yes. Because the passage of time is different for the, the, the twin moving faster. So the clock ticks slower, right? Or the clock ticks at a different rates for which, for which person. Let's think about that. So let's go back and let's make sure we, we, get, we understand this. So, um, so the twin, the twin on, um, let's see, the twin on Earth, okay? Yeah, you can talk about this for a second. The twin on Earth observes that Astrid's heartbeats are proceeding more slowly than her own. So for Eartha, the passage of time for the other twin who's going faster is ticking slower. It is a slower passage of time. So as a certain amount of time elapses in, in her frame, that same amount of time has not elapsed in Astrid's frame. Okay, does that make sense? And then the fact that the two can't make the exact same argument, it's because she has to turn, she has to decelerate and turn back around again. And so that deceleration process is what breaks the symmetry because there, she's not an inertial observer during that process. So there's, there's a link there then between what is uh, the passage of time and acceleration for inertial observers. But not, it's not exactly the passage of time because the, the passage of time is affected by the Lorenz factor. So we can't say that, the, um, that it's necessarily the acceleration is what causes the passage of time. It's a little bit like more ambiguous than that. However, the two observers can be differentiated because one of them did not stay inertial the whole time. If they both stayed inertial, then they could never go back and compare clocks. And I know that's kind of a cheat in a way. I feel like that's not complete, but that's the explanation we have up to this point. Yes? So, this inertial property is like absolute. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So, so yes. So, we would have to we'd have to start the process before uh, we'd have to assume that she accelerates before Astrid starts observing to get around that, and then she flies past at constant uh, velocity, and we start the clocks at the same time. Then the passage of time differs. She makes the observation, and then yes, both observers could notice when she decelerates during that time and comes back. That change, that deceleration could be measured by both. And it would be felt essentially as a kind of a force, right? Because we have this mass times acceleration is a force. So there would be a relativistic force uh, exerted when this ship is decelerating to zero and coming back the other direction. Yes. And that could be determined. That could be determined by both observers. Yes. So with this, we're essentially saying that we can't claim which object is moving to objects of if one is moving past the other. Yes. How would that translate to radial motion if something is moving past the other? That's a great question. So with radial motion, we can always determine which object is, in, is going, because radial motion always involves acceleration. There is, and that's why, that's why the special theory of relativity does not apply to gravitational systems. Because in a gravitational system, we always have a, uh, an acceleration occurring. Like when we're, we're accelerating constantly on Earth because we're going around the uh, sun in a different sense than the gravitational acceleration caused by just gravity itself from us being attracted to all the other mass on the earth. That's a different kind of acceleration. But when you're in orbit and, and you're doing a radial trajectory, 
you're not in an inertial frame of reference. If you're rotating, you're not in an inertial reference frame because that's an acceleration. A change in direction alone, even if you're at constant velocity, if you're changing direction, then you are accelerating and you're not an inertial observer. Does that make sense? Okay, great. All right, so that's the twin paradox. Um, and I think we, we already derived relativity of length, right? Yeah. So we can just kind of go past this. But I think we were to the point now where we wanted to do some examples. So let's do, um, let's do an example. Oh yeah, and we did lengths perpendicular to the relative motion too, and we showed that that does not cause a length contraction. So remember, lengths perpendicular to the relative motion do not undergo any kind of length contraction. OK, this is one we didn't do. A spaceship flies past Earth at a speed of 0.99 c. A crew member on board the spaceship measures its length, obtaining the value of 400 meters. What length do observers measure on Earth? OK, so let's do, pull out a sheet of paper. Let's try to work this one really quick. So we've got this um, spaceship here flying past Earth. OK, make it look like a fish or something. I don't know. It does some kind of crazy thing where its uh, length contracts. And it flies past Earth. It's going at 0.99 c. That's my u. Um, and a crew member on board the spaceship measures its length, and they see that it's 400 meters. So on the ship, in their frame of reference, the ship is 400 meters. But what about somebody on Earth all the way out here? I want to make that. I don't have any blue chalk. Yes, I do. Let's, let's say we have somebody on Earth. It just looks like a blue orb, essentially, when you're far enough away from it in space. Blue glowing orb, because the water is so much more water and clouds so much more than anything else. OK, so somebody on Earth, what do they see this length as? So we're going to use length contraction here to find out. So we have our u. It's 0.99c. And then we have our length contraction formula that we derived last class. So we have that the length is equal to the proper length, L0, times this 1 minus root 1 minus u squared over c squared. So we have 1 over the Lorentz factor that multiplies this out. So um, does that make sense where, how this came about? What is L0? L0 is the 400 meters. So L0 could be kind of analogous to proper time. It's proper length. So during this whole process, the observers on board the ship, they, they think they're at rest. OK. They think they're at rest, and they don't realize that they're moving. They think the Earth is flying past them. So we're going to treat their frame of reference as the proper length one. And then we've got this. So then the length that the observers observe on Earth, L, is going to be this L0 times root 1 minus u squared over c squared. And then L0 is 400. So we have 400 times this factor of root 1 minus 0 0.99c. The c's cancel. So we just have it like that. 
And then that gives us a length of only 54 uh, point or 56 point four meters. So here's an interesting thing. What would the length of the ship be if it moved at the speed of light? Zero. But then, wait a second. What is the length of a photon? Because we know that light, what's the length of a light wave then? Because the, a, a light wave travels at the speed of light and it has a, presumably some length associated with it. So what is, so what's the, what's the length of a radio wave? We, we know it, it has a length to it. It's got like, a radio wave is like a couple of meters. A microwave is like a couple of centimeters. What's the, um, does that mean that this is not applied to light? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't apply to light. But shouldn't it? It's something to think about. So there's, there's still some questions that are unanswered by this. But all I can tell you for, for this particular section is it doesn't apply to light. It applies to any object that has mass that's moving relative to another object. Because if you did plug in the speed of light for the relative velocity, you're going to get zero length because that just becomes one and it's just zero times whatever length it is in the reference frame of it. Um, but there's one little workaround for why it doesn't work for light. Can you guess why it doesn't work for light? I could, I could like, why do you think it doesn't work for light? Somebody, somebody here is, who's a physics junkie who reads about this kind of stuff a little bit. Why doesn't it work for light? Why does it give us a nonsense answer? Yes. It, because of the mass, yes. But what's special about an object that has mass that's different from objects that don't have mass? What does an object with mass have that an object that's massless doesn't have? Like momentum? That's a, no, but light does have momentum. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so that doesn't fix it. It's a little bit more abstract, than mo abstract property than momentum. What is it? It's a frame of reference that's at rest. Light has no rest frame. There's always a special frame of reference that the object with mass can be transformed to that's a rest frame. Remember, we said that, that every object in relativity that's, ma that, that's like, has, a, has one frame of reference that's at rest and then an infinite number of others that are at varying velocities, any continuum of velocities. With light, it has only one rest frame, but it's not at rest. Or no, not at rest frame. It has only one frame, but it's not at rest. It's moving at the speed of light. So that's the reason these formulas don't work because it doesn't occupy the same geometrical position in space-time as a massive object. It lies in a different region that this equation does not apply to. It's like a region of a map that light doesn't belong on. A space-time diagram you could think of, like uh, the light cone, okay? So we have like CT, and we've got some object moving less than the speed of light. It has to travel anywhere inside this light cone, but the light travels on the cone. These equations with length contraction, they don't apply to objects traveling on this cone. This is a special geometrical region where this algebraic relation does not hold. So to, to finally stress this final point, light has no rest frame, therefore this equation does not apply to it. Okay. So then um, the spaceship is shorter in a frame in which it is in motion than in a frame in which it is rest. To measure the length L, two Earth observers with synchronized clocks could measure the positions of the two ends of the spaceship simultaneously in the Earth's reference frame. And these two measurements will not appear simultaneous 
to an observer in the spaceship. Okay, that's weird. Let's read that one again, because that's weird. So, the spaceship is shorter in a frame in which it is in motion than in which it is at rest. So in Earth's frame, it appears shorter than it does in its rest frame, where the people on the ship, they're like, this thing's 400 meters. The people on Earth are like, no, it's not, it's 56.4. Okay, that part we know. But then to measure the length L, two Earth observers with synchronized clocks could measure the positions of both ends. So in other words, the person, the person sh finds, shoots a beam of light, hits it here, and then a person at another point on Earth shines a beam of light, hits it here, and they measure the two uh, ends of the ship as it flies past um, simultaneously in Earth's reference frame. So they say, okay, we're going to measure, we're going to measure this, this spaceship and it's going to be um, at the same time. So we shoot the, we shoot the rays of light. We're, we agree that these light rays hit the spaceship at the same time. But the spaceship says, no, they don't. Why is that? Why is it, why is it not, why are these two measurements not simultaneous to the observers on the spaceship? Why is that? Because the light, the, to make the measurement, they have to use a beam of light. They have to use something that has a velocity that's going to strike the ship. But the ship is moving while this happens. So it's going to encounter one of these beams before it encounters the other. This beam that's going to the tail end has to catch up to it to go the different to, to 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 get to the end while this while this uh, beam it runs into it sooner so the two the the two um, light beams do not hit the ship at the same time in the reference frame of the observers on the ship thus we have a relativity of simultaneity simultaneity an event that was simultaneous for, for these observers on Earth, the measurement of the length of the ship happens at the same time in their frame of reference. It is not simultaneously uh, happening for the observers on this ship. Does that make sense? It's kind of like that example with the train that we did with the lightning strike last time. Same idea here. And that's the reason for that. So light having a finite constant speed is what affects the simultaneity of events and making events not simultaneous for certain observers, where they are for other observers. OK? Any questions about that point? OK. So because of this length contraction, the dimensions of an object depend on the frame of reference of the observer. If an object is moving at constant velocity, relative to your inertial frame, its length is contracted along the direction of relative motion. There's no change in length perpendicular to the direction of the relative motion. Thus, the volume of something is going to be relative. Yes? I was just going to ask, like, if the length is different, does that mess with the volume and area of the object? It does. It makes the volume and area of an object relative to the frame of reference. So the observers on this ship may measure the, they won't, the ship won't be the same shape either. It could be squished. It's going to be, it's going to be the same height in both frame of references, but it's going to be shorter in this frame of reference, so it's going to look squished. Okay, now let's do another example. Observers O1 and O2 are 56.4 meters apart on Earth. Okay, so we've got some piece of land here on Earth. Got like a little bit of Antarctica, a little bit of South America. This would be like the United States up here. Then into Canada, a little bit of Alaska. All right, I'm not going to take too much time to draw this out. But basically, we've got this point on Earth. And then we've got these two observers some distance apart on Earth here. I know you can't really see that, but there's a little orange line denoting that distance. Let's say that that orange line is 56.4 meters apart on Earth. So two observers on Earth, they're 56.4 meters apart. 
Delta X is 56.4 meters. Um, how far apart does the spaceship crew measure them to be? So now the spaceship crew is, is measuring, making the measurement. So they're simultaneously measuring, they're shooting a beam of light back this way. So they could, they could have a, a crew member who shoots a beam of light to here and another one, another beam of light to there. How far does that measurement look for them? So now what becomes the proper length? The proper length becomes this 56.4 meters because remember, this spaceship is not accelerating. So it's just as correct to say that Earth, for them, that Earth flies away at 0.99 the speed of light in their frame of reference. So we just apply the length formula in the opposite sense. We have L is equal to 56.4 meters times 1 minus 0 0.99 squared. And then that gives us a shortened distance of 7.96 meters. So the entirety of Earth in this frame of reference looks squished. When they fly past Earth and they look at it at this speed, they're going to see Earth looking like it's going to be the same height, but it's going to be squished. And so all the distance points on the Earth itself are going to look closer together because of this squishing effect, because of the relativistic. Earth and then Earth as seen from space ship. There we go. So these two points, they, they go inwards. They get way closer together. Because the squishing goes that direction. No change in the perpendicular distance, though. Only this way. OK. So this answer does not say that the crew measures their spaceship to be both 400 meters long and 7.96 meters long. As measured on Earth, the tail of the spacecraft is at the position 01 at the same instant that the nose of the spacecraft is at the position of 02. Hence, the length of the spaceship measured on Earth equals 56.4 meters distance between 01 and 02. But in the spaceship frame, 01 and 02 are only 7.96 meters apart. And the nose, which is 400 meters in front of the tail, passes 02 before the tail passes 01. OK, so that's kind of weird. And that sort of reminds me of this other thing we're not going to talk about, which is the barn paradox. Um, but basically, so you have to think about the fact that this relativity of, of events, simultaneity, comes into play here when we talk about this length measurement again. It doesn't say that the crew measures their spaceship to be both 400 meters long and 7.96 meters long. Um, what it says is that, um, and I think that they made a mistake here, because the 7.96 meters, that applies to this distance on Earth. But what we're, what we're saying, I think what they're trying to say here is it should be 400 meters long and 56.4 meters long, right? That's what, that's what I think they're trying to say here. Because basically, um, well, let's see. OK, so the tail of the spacecraft is at position 01 at the same instant the nose of the spacecraft is at position of 02. OK, so. As measured on Earth, the spacecraft is at the position 01 at the same time that the nose of the spacecraft is at position of 02. 
So the length of the spaceship measured on Earth equals 56.4 meters distance between 01 and 02, which we found here from the first example. But in the spaceship frame, 01 and 02 are only 7.96 meters apart. Oh, OK, I see what they're saying here. Never mind, yeah. So the 56.4 becomes the um, distance between there. So they chose, this, they chose this distance for a reason. So they choose, they choose observers to be exactly 56.4 meters apart, which is the length that the spaceship looks shortened to to an observer on Earth. So that's why they choose that 56.4, because they, remember, we found that on Earth, the spacecraft looks like it's only 56.4 meters away. So then what they do in part two is they say, OK, what about two observers who are the same length away as what they measure the shortened spaceship to be? How far do they look on Earth? How far away, or how, um, which, how much distance away do they look to the spaceship? Even more shortened. But the resolution to this paradox where it seems to imply that it could be both 400 meters long and only 7.96 is that the timing is different for the two measurements. So as measured on Earth, the tail of the spacecraft is at 01 at the same instant that the nose of the spacecraft is at position of 02. So the length of the spaceship on Earth equals the 56.4 distance between 01 and 02. But that's for Earth. For, for Earth, they measure that for this point. But then, in the spaceship frame, O1 and O2 are only 7.96 meters apart. So um, what, they, what they're saying is, we could actually have these, the measurements of the spacecraft made by two observers, one here and one here, and they're 56.4 meters apart on Earth. So they make the measurement. And in their frame of reference, where they're, where they're standing 56.4 meters away from each other, they measure the spaceship to be at the same distance, uh, to be 56.4 meters uh, long, when, they're, when it's actually in their rest frame 400 meters. So they measure, they're 56.4 meters apart. They measure a spaceship to be 56.4 meters. The spaceship flies past and measures their distance to only be 7.96 meters. What's the resolution to that? Why do they make those two uh, differing measurements? Why don't they agree? Because the, as measured on Earth, the tail of the spacecraft is at position 01. At the same instant, the nose is at 02. So the length of the spaceship on Earth does equal that 56.4 meter distance between 01 and 02. But in the spaceship frame, 01 and 02, which is, let me mark this. This is 01 here on Earth, and this is 02 also here on Earth. In the spacecraft frame, when they're flying past, they look at those same points, and 01 and 02 are only 7.96 meters apart, and the nose, which is 400 meters in front of the tail, passes 02 before the tail passes O1. So O2 and O1 are not passed at the same point. So they're not, the events that occurs between them is not simultaneous. Okay, kind of weird, but that's the resolution to that. Okay, any questions about this one? No? Okay. Okay, so let's think a little bit about the visual appearance of a moving three-dimensional object. If we could think the positions of all points of the object simultaneously, it would appear to shrink only in the direction of motion. But we don't see all the points simultaneously. Light from points further from us take longer to reach us than does light from points near to us. So we see the further points as the positions they had at earlier times. So that's the idea about when we look into space and we see back in time, because the light that we're seeing now from, from galaxies, it took so many light years for it to travel to us. So we're seeing distant objects not as they appear now, but as they appeared 
millions, even billions of years ago with these telescopes. And that's the idea that is communicated here. Okay. Suppose we had a rectangular rod with its faces parallel to the coordinate planes. When we look on either at the either the center of the closest face of such a rod at rest, we see only that face. We see the center rod in computer generated uh, figure here. Okay, so this is the example. So we're looking at this rod and we're seeing how it looks when it's moving at different velocities. So you can see this idea that the volume and the shape of an object changes as it moves faster. You can see that its angle even, it looks like it's moving at a different angle even though it's not. Both of these figures, it's moving to the right, but it's not, it didn't rotate. It's just moving to the right at different velocities, but it looks rotating because the angles and the, the shapes of the volume that define the volume of this, of this rod are relative and changing. So it looks like there's a rotation occurring when there's not. And it ignores the color change that would occur due to the Doppler shift. So we're just looking at how the shape changes. So that's the idea of this volume change that occurs when we have um, relativistic velocities and it changes the volume. OK, let's do a quick 10 minute break. And then when we get back, we're going to do the Lorentz transformations. Just a second here. OK, so now we're going to talk about the uh, Lorenz transformations. What is this doing? OK, so we discussed the Galilean coordinate transformation equations. Um, they just relate the coordinates x, y, z of a point and frame of reference to coordinates x prime, y prime, z prime. Um, and they were really simple. They were just like, um, you know, x, t is equal to t prime. Basically, you could summarize them as this. t equals t prime, that's Galilean transformation in a nutshell. Then there's one for x, right? Uh, so v, v prime is equal to, like, say, v plus whatever relative velocity I have the two frames moving at. OK. So um, now we're ready to talk about um, the second frame. OK, sorry. Now we're ready to talk about the um, Lorenz transformations. So our first question is this. When an event occurs at point x, y, z at time t, what are the coordinates x prime, y prime, z prime, and t prime of the event as observed in the second frame? OK, so let's, let's write this out properly the way that a physicist would do if they were doing a physics problem involving relativistic speeds, which is done all the time at particle accelerators where we do have particles moving at relativistic speeds and relativistic physics holds. So, we're going to call um, S, we're going to say S has coordinates x, y, z, and t. And then we're going to say S prime has coordinates x prime, y prime, z prime, and t prime. So notice that I put my time coordinate as part of space. What that means is that I can draw a special kind of a vector, two special kinds of vectors, one that represents s and one that represents s prime. Because remember, remember from magnetism, position is a vector, right? What is the position vector in magnetism? Well, it's, uh, remember, it's a vector that points from our origin to the location of say, a charge, Q. That's a position vector. And we could say that the charge is located at x, y, z. Maybe it only has an x and a y component, and z is 0. Whatever. That's the idea for, for uh, a normal position vector. But now we have an extra one. If this charge is moving at relativistic velocities, which we have all the time, we have um, 
electrons going at close to the speed of light. We need to add an additional coordinate, t. And then remember that if we have a coordinate axis that has x, y, and z on it, we can rotate that axis and we can turn x into y. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean. So we've got some axes like this. If this is z, and this is x, and this is y, I can rotate z, rotate this so that z falls along x. Because this whole, and all these relationships are preserved under rotations. OK? So all these, all these relationships are preserved when I do a rotation. I can rotate z into x, and y rotates correspondingly, and it works. So I can view this coordinate system from any frame I want just by doing a rotation in any direction. Does that concept I just made there make sense about the rotation? OK, good, because that's very important, because that's exactly what a Lorentz transformation is. It's a rotation, but it's not just a rotation in space. It's a rotation in time as well. So we have to imagine like another vector. Actually, I'm going to do it in the same color, because I don't want you to really differentiate this. Now we have a t as well. And so we've got a four-dimensional space-time representing all of our coordinates. And this electron has all four of these. And if I change my, I can change frames of reference from, like, say, my reference frame to the electron's reference frame. And changing that reference frame is the same thing as doing a rotation of this coordinate system. It's a rotation in space time. That's what a Lorentz transformation does. And that's essentially what we've been doing when we've been finding these coordinate transformations that relate time in one frame of reference to time in another. We just didn't realize that's what we were doing geometrically. But that is what we're doing. So to derive the coordinate transformation, we refer to figure 37.15. So we've got this figure here where we have O and O prime, these origins of these two coordinate frames that correspond to, I shouldn't have erased that. Oh, well, I could erase this. Let's just erase this part and do it here. So we've got these uh, two different origins for two different observers. Each one has their respective coordinate system. So we've got O, so we've got Y and X in this frame. This is the origin for this one. We have Y and X. And then we've got O prime right next to it along the same lines. O prime. And then we've got um, X prime. I'll do X here. X, X prime y, y prime. OK. So there's our two coordinate frames. And then you can think of it as like there's a little bitty coordinate system that's associated with each one of these. And I think, I think drawing these little coordinate systems helps when you're doing these problems. You can always, for example, when we have the spaceship, you can draw a little coordinate system on board the spaceship, and you can call that like s prime. And then you can draw another little coordinate on Earth and call that s. That always works for helping to visualize these types of problems. OK, so the, um, in this figure, we assume the origins coincide at the initial time t equals 0 equals t prime. Then in s, the distance from o to o prime at time t is still ut. The coordinate x prime is a proper length in s prime. So s is contracted by the factor 1 over gamma, and thus the distance x from o to p as measured in s is not simply x equals ut plus x prime like it would be for the Galilean coordinate transformation. Instead, we have to include that Lorentz factor. So we have x is equal to ut. So what, you, what ut represents, it's represented by this distance here. 
distance between the origins. So we have u t because it's a velocity times time gives us a distance. So that's the distance between. And the origins coincide when time is zero. As time passes, this origin, this takes off and goes this way. This one stays still. So the distance between these two is given by the function ut, where it increases as time increases. And u is the instantaneous velocity. We ignore acceleration. We just say it instantaneously happens. We can do that by saying it's a light beam, because a light beam instantaneously shoots off. A light doesn't accelerate. It just immediately goes to the speed of light without acceleration. Um, or we can just think of it as like we start the time and it's moving beforehand, but the time doesn't start until it hits here, and then it keeps going at that constant velocity. That idea works as well. So the coordinate x prime is the proper length, and then in s prime, so s is contracted, so we have to do x is equal to ut. So it's equal to this. So x in this coordinate, so this has an x. This has an x. And this has an x prime. x, x prime. So the coordinate x in s is related to x prime by this. ut plus x prime square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. So at time t equals 0, these two origins are still different. There's still a, there's a contraction factor which affects the simultaneity of events. Because even at time equals 0, where they would correspond, where they would be exactly the same, in the Galilean transformation, they're not at exactly the same point in the Lorenz transformation. See what I mean? If, if, if it was just Galilean and we didn't have this factor, at time equals 0, x equals x prime. Otherwise, it equals uh, you know, x prime plus ut. But we have this factor. So even at time t equals 0, the x primes don't agree. x and x prime don't agree exactly on the exact coordinate. OK, so the distance from O to P then, as measured in S, is not simply x equals ut plus x prime. It's also modified by this. OK, so x prime is contracted to x prime divided by gamma. OK, um, please keep the talking down for the moment uh, is a little bit distracting. And we can talk about it more during discussion and also during office hours if you have any questions. OK, thank you. So in the frame s prime moves relative to frame s with constant velocity u along the common x, x prime axis, we've got that the origins coincide at times t equals 0. But the Lorentz coordinate transformation relates the space-time coordinates of an event as measured in the two frames, so in frame s and in frame s prime. As measured in frame of reference s prime, s, x prime is contracted. So in that frame of reference, x equals ut plus x prime. So then we can solve for x prime, and we get that x prime equals, so solving for this, we just move this over x minus ut divided by 1 minus u squared over c squared equals x prime. And then we have our relationship for how x changes with x prime. So this is part of the Lorenz coordinate transformation. Another part is the equation giving t prime in terms of x and t. To obtain this, we note that the principle of relativity it requires the form of the transformation from s to s prime to be identical to that from s prime to s. So the only difference is a change in the sign of the relative velocity component. Thus, it must be true that x prime equals minus ut prime. So x prime equals minus ut prime, or t is the prime, plus x times 1 minus u squared over c squared. 
So we have a plus sign there relating the two differences. Okay, so now we can relate these two to eliminate x prime, and this gives us an equation for t prime in terms of x and t. And so what we've done is we've shown how the coordinates of x and t are related. So we have that we can relate t prime to t and x in the following way. We have t minus this relative velocity times x over c squared. And all of that divided by the gamma factor again, 1 minus u squared over c squared, or times the gamma factor, I should say, because it's 1 over that. OK, so that's our coordinate relation. So what we did was we showed how um, if I do a, si a secondary coordinate system here, we've got, um, we've got, oops. If this is x, y, z, t, this is going to be x, y, z, t uh, primes. And then we can relate these two origins, O and O prime, by the following transformation. And this tells me that where I'm at t prime, this is where I'm at in terms of t and x in this coordinate system. Or I could think of it as I could have these two superimposed on each other. And then if this one is directly on top of the other, then the two are related by a rotation. Just like I could take two x, y, z coordinate systems and I could superimpose them or I could rotate one a little bit, and they would be related by some transformation equation that translates between the two different coordinate systems that are superimposed. So that's what's going on geometrically with this Lorenz transformation. So when we just have motion in the x direction, we have a transformation in two coordinates not just one. The two coordinates are x and t. So here we have that the x prime is related to x by this transformation, and t prime is related to t by this transformation. So quite unlike normal, what we're used to in classical physics, where I have um, motion in one direction, if it's regular space time in, th or in three dimensions, like we've done in all of our magnetism problems and stuff, how many transformation equations are there for relative motion in one direction? Somebody who's been uh, talking in the back, the guy in the back. I heard your voice a couple times. What's the, what's the relationship between, how many, how many equations are there for an object moving relative to another object if we're not worrying about relativistic effects, if it's just regular motion in classical physics. How many transformation equations do we have? Uh, OK, so how many would there be then? Wrong. There's one, because there's only relative motion in one direction for x. So I said in the beginning, there's relative motion x in the x direction, and the other coordinate system is stationary. There's only one equation. But in relativity, that same transformation, I have relative motion just in x. I have two coordinate transformation equations, one for x prime and one for t prime. Do you see how that's weird and different? So relative motion just in one spatial direction gives me two transformation equations, one in a spatial direction and one in a time direction. OK, so there, that's the. That's the relationship between those two. So that's what's different about a Lorentz transformation. Yes? Um, you can't really do that. You have to do it. You have to think of it in terms of a rotation. 
So it's, it's, yeah, that's what I would say. You have to think of it as a rotation. And just remember that we're in normal 3D space where you have motion just along the x direction and you have another, it's just one transformation equation relating x to x prime. But in, in the Lorentz transformations, we have to have one for time as well, always. And it would be the same if we instead moved along y or uh, z instead. So, uh, yes, you would. Yes, you would. You would always have Lorentz transformations in whichever direction you're moving along. So the point, the point is, is that when there's a relative velocity between two frames of reference, but, but let's think about it like this, though. If we had, let's say we had some general change in all four coordinates. Do we have five Lorentz transformations? No, still four. So what that means is that relative motion between two frames of reference in relativity always implies movement along the time axis as well. Whenever there's a relative velocity difference between two frames of reference, you can always equate that to two coordinate changes, not just in the direction, not just in the space direction, but also in the time. Therefore, space-time itself is a vector. It's not, um, it's not some kind of like, uh, time is not a scalar anymore that we can just superimpose on problems. We have to treat time as having a precisely defined position almost. But it's not a position in the same sense as space. It's a position in, uh, in time, space-time, the unified four-dimensional space-time that we now have. And similarly, the same way that you can do a rotation into, um, say, rotate x into z, you can essentially kind of rotate x into time, or time into time prime, whichever. That's a kind of a rotation there. Okay, That's an example of that. And that's another type of rotation here. So that's what these Lorentz transformations uh, signify. They prove, the, um, they prove that space-time is an actual thing, and that time really is a vector, not just some scalar. Yes? Well, it's not going to be essential for solving problems on the exam. But basically, to understand the rotation a little better, just remember that I can always rotate my coordinates by some angle. And I can, I can place these two coordinates in alignment somehow by doing a rotation. And that's essentially what I'm saying here. Yes. It's the part that's essential for the understanding for the class, the reason I'm even talking about it is because it's important to communicate that this is a geometrical fact and an aspect of our physical reality. It's not just some mathematical construct that isn't real. Space-time is an actual real thing. Time is physically not a constant thing for everybody. Time is relative, and it's just like I could say, what's my position, x? It depends on who you ask. From your frame of reference, my x position is not the same. For me, wherever x is, it's right where I'm standing. For you, it's someplace else. Time is the same way. That's what is shown by these Lorentz transformations. So it's very important for proving the validity of Einstein's hypothesis. <clears throat> so when u and vx are much smaller than c, the denominator in equation 37, the equation we just did, approaches 1, and we approach the non-relativistic result, vx prime equals vx minus u. The opposite extreme is in the case where vx equals c. And then we find this result. So vx prime, when vx is equal to c, we replace this with c here, and we have c minus u equals this. And then we just have c. So vx prime is equal to c no matter what. So these Lorentz transformations, they agree with the constancy of the speed of light. So not only were we able to come up with a Lorentz transformation that accurately 
de defines time as, as a geometrical construct. But when we do so, we find a relationship that preserves the speed of light being a constant for all frames of reference. So we have the added validity of the Lorentz transformation giving us that result as well. So that's very nice to see. So this says that anything moving with velocity is equal to c measured in s also has the velocity of c in vx prime measured in s prime despite the relative motion of the two frames. So this equation is consistent with Einstein's postulates about the speed of light in a vacuum being the same in all inertial frames of reference. And then the principle of relativity tells us there's no fundamental distinction between the two frames, s and s prime. Thus, the expression for vx in terms of vx prime must have the same form with vx changed to vx prime and vice versa. So these are reversible, and we can get this to get the opposite result. So we have the Lorentz velocity transformations as well. And you can obtain this by just plugging and chugging through, and you get that result. So um, we can skip that. So then when u is less than c, the Lorentz velocity transformations show us that an object moving with a speed less than c in one frame of reference always has a speed less than c in every other frame of reference. This is one reason for concluding that no material object may travel with a speed equal to or greater than c. So it's all given by the geometry of this now. So we can see that we have restrictions about the speed of light. And it's not some arbitrary restriction that we have no explanation for. It's due to the very structure of space-time of which we all reside itself. These equations are the relativistic generalization of the Galilean coordinate transformation of t equals t prime. For values that approach 0, this value goes to 1, and this term approaches 0. So in this limit, in the limit that the, the relative velocities become very small, this, turns, this term goes away. It just essentially becomes uh, 1. And we have x prime equals x minus ut. So this bottom business is what's responsible for all of this relativistic correction, which is what we found when we derived the relativity from the train example. So now we have the proper mathematical formulation, which we started with where we got to before with the train and the light uh, pulse and the lightning strikes. Now we have it shown for um, the mathematical description of space-time. So then we have these uh, gamma gives us the differential dx primes then. So this just is the calculus version. So what, I'm saying, what they're saying here is they're saying, OK, we can make these transformations differentially small. And the x prime becomes a dx prime. So it's just a little bit of calculus there. And you get the same result. And then they factor out the gamma. And, and x just becomes dx. And t just becomes dt. That's all they did there. And then finally, we can divide the first by the second. And then we get dx prime divided by dt prime. And then that gives us our relationship for vx prime. So then we have vx prime is equal to vx minus u, 1 minus the relative velocity between the two frames times the velocity in the x frame, not the x prime, but the x frame, divided by c squared. So now we have, so we have a position, a time, and a velocity transformation that we came up with. And the last, all they did in the last step, what did we do to go from a position transformation to a velocity transformation? We just differentiated with respect to time. Because that's all we ever had to do with kinematics, right? All you have to do when you have a kinematics equation relating the positions of two objects to relate it to the velocity of the two objects is just differentiate those two respective functions with respect to time. And then we get our velocity transformation. That's what they did here. Same idea. So that last step, even though it looks a little bit complicated, the principle is very simple. It just comes straight from 
kinematics. V equals dx by dt. Okay, great. That is all that I wanted to go over um, in terms of the Lorenz transformations and the um, mathematics. This is kind of an interesting little um, example about how we can think of the charges in the Maxwell's equations being relativistically invariant. This will not be on the exam. This is from a more advanced textbook on relativity than what you're used to working with. But basically, the idea of the premise is that the reason the charges, remember we had those two wires. In fact, I'm not even going to read this verbatim. I'm just going to show you this picture. I'm going to explain what they're communicating here. Because this is kind of cool. So I'm going to illustrate an example from relativity. So this is kind of this is kind of neat. OK, so let's say we have, I want to make these the same size. Let's say we have a wire, and we have current flowing in two wires. And we want to look at a section. We want to look at a section between the two wires, OK? Do we remember, do we remember what the force was relating the two wires if the two currents are traveling in the same direction? What, is, what happens to these two wires? What's the force that they feel between each other? They feel a what force? Attraction. And what kind of force is it? Is it a magnetic or an electric? Magnetic. OK, why is it not electric? Because the wire is electrically, why? Why isn't, there, why isn't there an electric? There is, right? But there shouldn't be, shouldn't there be a uh, repulsive electric force as well felt between these two wires? Because, because there's, these are, this is negatively charged, and this is negatively charged. So why, aren't they, why are they attracting and not repulsed from each other? So it has to do with the fact that the two wires have current flowing in them. The current is flowing, and the current then has a Lorentz transformation associated with it. And while, while that Lorentz transformation is not big enough for us to see in other ways or measure with a, with a, um, with a ruler, for example, we can't measure the length contraction of an electron when it's moving and forming a current. We can't measure it, or can we? Actually, we can measure the length contraction of these two electrons. Because what's happening is, in this wire, when these electrons are equally spaced apart, the wire in the wire's frame of reference, when it sees this wire going this way, it sees the charges spaced closer together than in its frame. And the charges, so there's a contraction, there's a length contraction going on in this way, where in this frame of reference of these charges, these charges see these charges squished in closer together. So those segments of the wire of a given segment with the same, what should be this, let's say there's one, two, three, four, five charges. One, two, three, four, five charges. Let's say there's five charges in a given section of wire. In this frame of reference of this, of this it sees a charge going in, in, in squished spatially in an opposite sense. And it produces an attractive force, depending upon whether it's the direction that it's contracted. So for example, we see here we have these two reference frames. Um, we have negative and positive going here. And actually, we need more than just positive charges. We need negative charges as well. So let's say we have a wire. Let's say we have two wires going, and we have positive and negative charges here. So we have positive and negative charges. What's going to happen is, even though they're electrically neutral, and there shouldn't be a force, 
between them normally. With the electrically neutral ones, because of the length contraction, the charges look like they're, there is a charge, and so there's, an, a, there's a force, an attractive force, in both frames. So in this frame, it sees the charges, it sees the charges squished together. And it sees that there's actually a concentration of charge because there's more charges located in a region than in its region. So in other words, actually I'll start with this one. So in this one, if, the, if neither one of them has charges moving, they're electrically neutral and there's no attraction. But then when this thing starts moving, it sees this one as having some kind of uh, length contraction. So now the charges, even though there's an equal number of charges, they're squished together in a different region and spaced apart differently. And so that different spacing causes there to be a net attractive force, depending upon the frame of reference. So we can see how the Lorentz transformations give us the um, result that we have magnetism. So electric and magnetic fields can transform into mag electric fields can transform into magnetic fields and vice versa and the relationship is also due to the Lorentz transformation. So what turns out to be the case is electric and magnetic fields are also part of the same vector field, the electromagnetic vector. And what Einstein, by demanding the, um, the Maxwell's equations be valid in every reference frame, what he did was he, figured, he helped figure this out. He and other scientists, they figured out that one person's magnetic field is another person's electric field. And the two fields are related by Lorentz transformations. And you, can't, you, you never really just have a magnetic field or an electric field. You always have both. And both of these fields have uh, components in, in different frames of reference. In one frame of reference, it might just look like a magnetic field. In another frame of reference, it might just look like an electric field. But the behavior has to be consistent with these Lorentz transformations and with these frames of reference. So that's essentially the idea here, we have these different charge distributions that look differently to the charges. And so they see this length contraction, and they decide whether or not to be attracted or repulsed to the other wire, depending upon the direction of relative motion. So um, because we have these different uh, velocities, for example, they have v minus greater than v plus the Lorentz contraction of the spacing between negative charges is more severe than between the positive charges. So, so that's what's going on in this case, because we have uh, different velocities for the negative and positive charges. We can make these charges going at different speeds. We can have one current corresponding to electrons going one speed, and another current corresponding to protons uh, going at a different speed. And then if the velocities are different, the Lorentz contraction of the spacing between negative charges is more severe than between positive charges. And then the wire carries a negative charge. So if the spacing is different, we can make these charges go one speed and these charges go another. If, if let's say, the positive charges go, are going faster, the negative charges stay the same distance apart as the others as the others in the wire. So there's no difference between the negative charges in this case. But then if the positive ones are closer together, then it still looks like there's a net positive charge, and this thing can still be attracted to it. There's some sort of a net attractive force here. And same thing for this one, too. So we're going to have the spacing is going to be different for this. It's going to look different for this one when we have the different velocities. And then if we change it and we do the opposite case, where we have them going at different speeds, let's say we make one of these going this way and one of these going this way, we can reverse the relationship and make the force not attractive, but make it repulsive. And so that's essentially how you can show relativistically that the magnetic force, what looks like magnetic in our frame of reference, actually looks like, um, okay, 
that actually looks um, electric in the other frame of reference. So there's, that's, a, that's basically the idea I wanted to get here, is that we see these two wires and charges moving at some constant speed. And from our frame of reference, we say there's an attraction there. It's magnetic. The charges, they see a force, and they see the force as an electric force because the charges that they're attracted to or repulsed from, it's because the spacing in the charges in their frame has undergone Lorentz contractions. So it changes what looks like a neutral charge distribution no longer looks neutral because the spacings between positives and negatives is not equal anymore. OK, so that was essentially everything that I wanted to cover for today, um, conceptually and in terms of working the problems. On Thursday, we can do maybe a couple more relativity examples, and then we'll just go over a grand overview and a, and a final conclusion for the course so that you're, you know what you need to work on for the final. And we end with a strong uh, synopsis of everything. OK, see you all on Thursday. And we have a quiz on Thursday as well.